wonderful Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 3. Mm. Celebrated verse, text 19. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya If you listen to recordings of Prabhupada lectures, you'll be very familiar with this verse, Sva Vidvaraho Strakarai. Sangstuta Purushak Pashu. It's like heavy verse. Men who are like dogs, hogs, camels, and asses praise those men who never listen to the transcendental pastimes of Lord Sri Krishna, the deliverer from evils. Sva, a dog. Vidvara, Vidvara, the village hog who eats stool. <laughs> Svavidvara, Utstra, Ustra, camel, and Kara, asses. Sangstuta Purushak Peru, they praise those who never listen to the Glories of the Personality of Godhead. Purport. The general mass of people, unless they are trained systematically for a higher standard of life in spiritual values, are no better than animals. It's a long purport. And, in this verse, they have been particularly put on the level of dogs, hogs, camels, and asses. Modern university education. Here we go. Practically appears one to acquire a doggish mentality with which to accept the service of a greater master. After finishing a so-called education, the so-called educated person moves, move persons, move like dogs from door to door with application for some service and mostly they are driven away informed of no vacancy. As dogs are negligible animals and serve the master faithfully for bits of bread, a man serves a master faithfully without sufficient rewards. Here we go. Persons who have no discrimination in the matter of food stuff and who eat all sorts of rubbish are compared to hogs. Hogs are very much attached to eating stools. So, stool is a kind of foodstuff for a particular type of animal, and even stones are eatables for a particular type of animal or bird. But the human being is not meant for eating everything and anything, semicolon. He is meant to eat grain, vegetables, fruits, milk, sugar, etc. Animal food is not meant for the human being. For chewing solid food, the human being has a particular type of teeth meant for cutting fruits and vegetables. The human being is endowed with two canine teeth as a concession for persons who will eat animal food at any cost. It is known to everyone that a man's food is another man's poison. Human beings are expected to accept the remnants of food offered to Lord Sri Krishna. And the Lord accepts foodstuffs from the categories of leaves, flowers, fruits, etc. Let's paraphrase a Bhagavad Gita 926. As prescribed by Vedic scriptures, no animal food is offered to the Lord. Therefore, a human being is meant to eat a particular type of food. You should not imitate the animals to derive so called vitamin values. Therefore, a person who has no discrimination in regard to eating is compared to a hog. Then comes the camel. The camel is a kind of animal that takes pleasure in eating thorns. 
a person who wants to enjoy family life or the worldly life of so-called enjoyment is compared to the camel. Materialistic life is full of thorns, and so one should live only with the prescribed method of Vedic regulation just to make the best use of a bad bargain. Life in the material world is maintained by sucking one's own blood. The central point of attraction for material enjoyment is sex life. To enjoy sex life is to suck one's own blood, for there is not much more to be explained in this connection. The camel also sucks its own blood while chewing thorny twigs. The thorns the camel eats cut the tongue of the camel, and so blood begins to flow within the camel's mouth. The thorns, mixed with the flesh blood, create a taste for the foolish camel. And so he enjoys the thorn-eating business with false pleasure. Similarly, the great business magnets, industrialists, who work very hard to earn money by different ways and questionable means, eat the thorny results of their action mixed with their own blood. Therefore, the Bhagavatam is situated these diseased fellows along with the camels. Hmm. Next paragraph. The ass is an animal who is celebrated as the greatest fool, even amongst the animals. The ass works very hard and carries burdens of maximum weight without making any profit for itself. The ass is generally engaged by the washerman, whose social position is not very respectable, and the special qualification of the ass is that it is very much accustomed to being kicked by the opposite sex. When the ass begs for sexual intercourse, he is kicked by the fair sex, yet he still follows the female for sex, sexual pleasure. A hand-packed man is compared, therefore, to the ass. The general mass of people work very hard, especially in the age of Kali. In this age, the human being is actually engaged in the work of an ass, carrying heavy burdens and driving tela and rickshaws. The so-called advancement of human civilization has engaged a human being in the work of an ass. The laborers in great factories and workshops are also engaged in such burdensome work, and after working hard during the day, the poor laborer has to be again kicked by the fair sex, not only for sex enjoyment, but also for so many household affairs. Final paragraph. So, Srimad Bhagavatam's categorization of the common man without any spiritual enlightenment in the society of dogs, hogs, camels, and asses is not at all an exaggeration. The leaders of such ignorant masses of people may feel very proud of being adored by such a number of dogs and hogs, but that is not very flattering. The Bhagavatam openly declares that although a person may be a great leader of such dogs and hogs disguised as men, if he, that's the leader, has no taste for being enlightened in the science of Krishna, such a leader is also an animal and nothing more. He may be designated as a powerful, strong animal or a big animal, but in the estimation of Srimad Bhagavatam, he has never given a place in the category of man on account of his atheistic temperament. Or, in other words, such godless leaders of dogs and hog-like men are bigger animals with the qualities of animals in greater proportion. I mean, he's heavy. And it's not just he writes this in the Bhagavatam. He would go at it. On the authority of the Bhagavatam, but 
you know, a major purpose, my understanding at least, a major purpose was to rattle people's cages, like shake them by the lapel and have them wake up, being lulled by just following foolish leaders and living a life of a polished animal, considering that to be, that's great, or that's, that's advancement. Again and again and again. I mean, he wouldn't always use these same phrases, hogs, dogs, camels, and asses, but sva vidra hostra karai, I've heard it so many times. He would, not as elaborately as in this purport, speak eating indiscriminately, seeking um, a dog-like position through modern education. I mean, another strong uh, comparison he would make is modern education is creating sudras, meaning specifically. After modern education, if one doesn't get a master, then he's destitute. Because without a master, someone that has a sudra capacity can't survive. <laughs> and he would describe then, like going to the, from door to door and wagging one's tail, please throw me a bone. It's, it, he wasn't fond of the um, reducing human form of life to being minus the finer sentiments want to speak of not understanding the real mission of human life because modern education certainly requires uh, intellectual faculty. That's one of the things that universities do. They hone intellectual faculty, but towards what end? In, in terms, specifically, in terms of building character or specifically in terms of teaching who you are. I'm just re hearing a recording, recorded lecture. Srila Prabhupada was speaking in Gainesville, University of Florida. And he went at it. I mean, he like frontal attack, saying, you know, where in the university is that field of training to teach people who they are, Aham Brahmasmi? Where is it? missing. Instead, they're training sudras. And, it, you know, it's, this would say it bluntly, right at, you know, right in the face of whoever were the heads of the university, as well, of course, the students. Like, so it's, it's not like those fields shouldn't be learned, or there's something wrong with those fields. It's just when it's minus character, and it's minus the understanding of who you are, eternally speaking, who you are. And that means who is the Supreme and our relationship with the Supreme, that's unpacking who you are. Then it's a misuse of human form of life. And there's consequences. I mean, you asked about impetus, I've been thinking about it. If you misuse the human form of life, there's consequences. And what are the consequences? You, you, you don't know where you're going. And likely, if the, if, supposing someone is given a million dollars, supposing there's a, you know, a benevolent person and he starts distributing million, a million dollars to all the people in his neighborhood or whatever, some group of people, how are they going to use that million dollars? See, some people can, it is said, I don't know if it's a fact, but I'm not surprised. It is said the people that win the lottery, their lives become spoiled. For, you know, a few reasons. One, they have no idea how to use that wealth. Two, the persons who were their friends now become greedy to get some of their wealth. And, you know, the, the, there's, so like that, the human form of life is a great wealth and is bestowed upon those who 
by evolutionary process come to the human form of life. And here's this bestowed form that has a purpose and not knowing the purpose, then it can be misused. Supposing somebody that doesn't know the purpose of a, an iPhone is given an iPhone and they don't know the purpose. So they may use it to crack open walnuts because they want some, the walnut that's inside the nut. They just destroy or misuse the sophisticated technology thing. But so supposing somebody knows how to use an iPhone, how to do sense gratification with it. And there's lots of sense gratification things that can be done by use of technology. And on and on and on and on. So without the purpose of life, it doesn't lead to elevation. It leads to confusion, if not further degradation. It's a problem. It's definitely a problem. A high school student here in Portland asked me, how do I <clears throat> respond to my friends when they start talking about the recent Supreme Court decision about abortion, the Roe versus Wade topic? Because there's people on both sides and they get really extreme and they ask me what my position is and I don't want to get involved in extremism. So, I, you know, what would be your advice? It can just be very simple, very simple. You know, you, you're, you know, persons on this side, persons on that side, because it's Kali Yuga, the people are going to quarrel over trifles, what to speak about life, not a trifle. So the advice I gave is don't get involved. But if you're asked, say, I, I, I have an opinion. Yes, I have an opinion. But, you know, you, you may be to your liking, may not be to your liking. I can't say. I, so I'm not involved in the dialogue. But my position is I don't have the right to take another's life. Unless there's the consequence of someone's life is at stake, and then that's another consideration. But when it's not a life-risking situation, I don't have the right. And... If I think I have the right, then there's no restraint for using that which is God-given purpose, which is producing life. Life produces life. And without any consideration of that consequence, then killing, taking life is the solution. So I, you know, I wouldn't advocate that. There's a, there's a verse in... Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 30, Verse Number 1. You can look it up later. 3.31. Where uh, the movement of the living entity is the title of the chapter. The very first verse describes very in very clear terms that the soul is present at the time of conception. The soul is present at the time of conception. There isn't conception without the presence of the soul. And in Ayurveda, there's another verse that translated says the same thing. The soul is present from the very beginning of conception. So since the soul is present, I, I, it may be um, not able to defend itself because... <laughs> because it's at the beginning stage of you know, formation of a body. That because somebody is weak, does that mean it's perfectly okay to take their life? Anyway, um, if there isn't a spiritual conception of life, 
then it leads to madness and impetus. If there isn't a spiritual conception of life, it leads to madness. And there's consequences for madness. There's consequences for those who take the life of other living entities. There's consequences for taking the life of animals. There's consequences. There's consequences for taking life. Not knowing the fundamental teaching that a living entity is a spirit soul, then one takes consequences. And there, so back to the, this verse, there's hogs, dogs, camels, asses. They don't have a spiritual conception of life. And those that don't have a spiritual conception of life, they have behaviors that are animal-like, different in different departments of and species of animals. This, that, the other, the other. So it, it's it's spelled out. Don't need to repeat. I'll just uh, a- anecdotal. One time I was visiting Bitspalani to do a, a program, you know, with, with a group of devotees that were involved in the university there. And uh, during the day, I went for a Japa walk because Bitspalani is kind of a remote campus. So I was walking along the, the street just outside the campus and there were some camels. And sure enough, with their long necks, they weren't just eating the leaves on the trees, they're eating the thorns from the leaves on the trees. And little, you know, drool of blood was coming down the side of their mouth from chewing the thorns because that was their happiness. I mean, they didn't go to thorn chewing school, they just, that's their nature. And people also find some happiness, Prabhupada chooses to not go into it. But the the, the Sex act is simply, from the, the male side, transformation of blood and relieving themselves of whatever the quantity of blood is in the course of sex act. And that's the happiness. Is the happiness like the camel chewing thorns? And, and it, it, um, it, it's natural. The reproductive system People don't have to go to school to learn it. Animals and birds and fish and all species, it's built in. So that the cycle of life continues because then impetus. And if there's no sense of, like we discussed yesterday, of regulating things that are an impetus, then it leads to consequences in chaotic personal life and do it at large scale in society. So we don't like chaos. We like the enjoyment feature of senses and sense objects, but we don't like the the chaos that follows, unrestricted. Therefore, the Vedas have some regulation for elevation. But those that don't have regulation for elevation and and, and also the purpose of that elevation, the society becomes chaotic and goes further and further and further. Here's something that uh, is related. It's unrelated and it's related. The, I was thinking about this yesterday from the, the discussion about time is cyclical. In the four yugas, Satya Treta Dwarpa Kali, things go down and down and down and down. And when they get so far down, at the end of Kali, Yuga, it's described in the 12th canto of the Bhagavatam, how does it go back up again? It goes back up again by, at the end of Kali, the personality of Godhead in the form of Kalki Avatar liberates all those living entities that have become so absolutely degraded that vestiges of spiritual elevation are gone. And during our present age, it goes rapidly. So 
a visual image. Like it's easy, it helps me to understand things visually. Supposing you have a big vat of pure white paint and you stir it. And if you stir, 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 it has something like a vortex that it goes down from the stirring um, um, movement. And you take over here an eyedropper full of blue and over there an eyedropper full of red. And what happens? It's no longer pure white, it's off-white. And then the nature of the activity that's influenced by ignorance and passion, because the material modes of nature have some ignorance and passion, there's consequences for the ignorance and there's consequences for the passion, which means, using that visual example, the blue and the red get darker. It keeps getting darker by activities that are in ignorance and activities that are in passion. It's darker and darker. So it's like, you know, the, the, the vat of paint gets darker and darker and it goes down and down and down and then it's the end of the age of Kali. And at the end of the age of Kali, those darkened living entities, darkened by the modes living entities, they're eliminated. And then Satya Yuga starts again. It goes right back up to the top by uh, great personalities. The way that it's described for this particular Yuga cycle is our Vyasa Dev, who was the guru of Madhvacharya. This, this is also related to yesterday's discussion. Where's Madhvacharya? How did Madhvacharya meet Vyasa? Because Vyasa is how long ago? So long ago. Different yuga. When he compiled the Vedas, previous yuga. So how did Madhvacharya receive knowledge from Vyasa? It's described in the biography of his life, very, very, very elaborate biography of Madhva's life. He was traveling throughout India and he went to the Himalayas, he went to Badri, and because he was um, the, uh, one of the sons of Vayu, he had the capacity to move very swiftly and he was very strong. So he, he, he was traveling with one assistant, this is what the biography describes, and he was traveling so swiftly his assistant couldn't follow him. And where'd he go? He entered into the upper realm of Badri, and then they go into some detail and describe something like this. There's um, higher dimensional Badris. There's seven dimensions. And he was Vyas. Where's Vyas? He's in one of those upper dimensions of Badri. Besides, you know, when, you, when you go visit Badrinath. I'm hoping to visit Badrinath next year. I'm hoping with a group of devotees. And uh, then he sat before Vyas. The, the, the description of Vyasa's ashram is there in this biography. It's like a, not just a, a heavenly place, it's a very special place. He's an incarnation of the Lord in a very special ashram with other ashram assistants with him. And he... Madhvacharya wanted verification of the teachings that he had developed. He placed them before Vyasa Vyas certified. And then he descended back to the place where his assistant was. And then he continued with his travels. It said that at the end, after Kalki Avatar finishes the uh, demoniac population at the end of Kali Yuga, Vyas and his ashram assistants descend, and that's how Satya Yuga begins, because they're in pure goodness. And they and their assistants see to it that the, the ultimate plan of time continues, and Satya Yuga begins way up there in, in, the, in the quality of knowledge, detachment, purification. Now, how do we know about these things? 
We know about these things from Scripture, and otherwise we're not going to know these things. We can't even calculate, you know, 427,000 more years in the age of Kali. How do we calculate that? But through the uh, authority of the Vedas, we can have an understanding. These are um, outcomes that are going to take place in due course of time. And if supposing one, so back to the verse, supposing one doesn't have that connection with transcendental knowledge, then it's, it's animal life. Without transcendental knowledge, without knowing who we are, and the, 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 the purpose of human life is knowing who we are, knowing who is the Supreme, and being in that relationship with the Supreme, that's the purpose. And without knowing that, it remains animal life with different characteristics, animal-like existence. And it goes on. And looking around and seeing it going on, it's not pleasant. Impetus. I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be, I want to be part of the solution. And then that's an impetus. So it's an impetus to seek transcendental knowledge and live one's life according to transcendental knowledge, even though there's a lot of opposition all around to do that kind of lifestyle. And we have lots of freedom. Uh, two, two more things, and I'm going to end. Giriraj Maharaj sent something out on the 4th of July. It was really nice. Did I send that to you? Giriraj Maharaj? Did I send it to you? Oh. So did you see the July 4th message he sent out? Here's the July 4th message. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, he left Dallas heading back for California on July 4th. When he went through the, through the Dallas airport, he saw a gigantic flag waving, and he said, I was very surprised. I felt joy. And then he was looking inside, why am I feeling this joy? And it wasn't just because of bodily identification. He remembered Prabhupada saying, uh, America has been very good to me. Uh, they've supplied many men, they've supplied many finances, and now the men who have been supplied by this country are going all over the world to help spread Krishna consciousness, to make people happy, so I feel very indebted to America. So, it, that's not verbatim, but it's something along those lines. Prabhupada wanted the world to be happy, and he was also but as a cultured person, feels uh, krita gya, a sense of gratitude to those who one has received some kindness. He felt he received kindness from America. So we have the freedom, that's the, you know, the American flag, says home of the, what is it? Land of the free and home of the brave. There's other places where there isn't that kind of freedom. And still, that surcharge with opposition place, I'm speaking now of China, there's a, there, the, there's a devotee in China that's um, a woman in a female body, and she's, uh, she, at this, she's, a, she's a leader amongst the Chinese devotees. She's a leader just by her personality. And now for the fourth time, the place where she established an ashram is being taken over by the government for the fourth time. There's like a whole history of attempts to have something and they move to another place and then move to another place because the government just decided this is an area where we want to have housing. So people just had to vacate. It wasn't like negotiable. Kind of like what happens in America, I forget what the name is called, when they want to build a road. 
people have to sell their house at a fair market price. But it's there's some law that says if the government decides to build a road through a place where your house is, you have to give up your house. So the the Chinese government, because they're it's the Chinese government, when they want to do something, there's no discussion. It's like get out. So they, they had to shut down. This is the fourth time. And the devotee wrote to me saying, we'll find another place because I've now become accustomed to this lifestyle. And they can't have temples in China. It's like they can't have temples. We have temples. We have freedom. We can do stuff without going into it. You know, the government monitors their, 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 their text messages that they were sharing with me. Anyway, we have freedom, and we should use it properly and be, be very grateful that we have it and use it properly because otherwise the freedom can be misused. And then there's consequences. But we don't know how to properly use this human form of life and the, the resources that are available to us by God's grace. It can be uh, you know, opportunities for degradation. And that goes on. Higher education and technology and, you know, life resources. We have to be careful when you have freedom. It's a life of responsibility. So that's what's being spoken here. Let's see if there's some discussion. Quarter after. Svavidvara Hostrakarai. Hare Krishna Guru Raj, I have a thought. You know, reading this verse, uh, if we read it superficially or maybe, you know, just the translation of the verse, it feels like we do it all the time in today's world when going to workplace or meeting with other people. We do appreciate them all the time. And so? So it looks like like uh, who are like dogs, hogs and camels. So are we in that category while doing that, by appreciating them? Appreciating them? No. Why are you saying that? Because if we read it superficially, that's how it looks like. It okay. sounds like. What? What? So that that's not. Let's let's go into it a little bit. It's not vilification of you know what you described. I'm not even even exactly sure what you described. If you see people with nice qualities and you appreciate them, is there something wrong with that? No. But other people, they are not involved in Krishna consciousness, like the men who never listen to the transcendental pastimes of Lord Krishna. But that's where it goes. That's where that train goes. The train goes to degradation. We'll say it the other way. The train towards elevation is resting upon knowledge of transcendence or hearing topics of transcendence. In a society... As the, as the yuga progresses, as the yugas progress, the interest in involvement in <clears throat> hearing transcendental message diminishes. And as it diminishes, behaviors become degraded. That's the point. Pra, here, here's, you know, Prabhupada said, when he was young, uh, whenever there was a public gathering, Without exception, there would be someone who would recite something from Ramayana or Mahabharat. It's just part of the culture. That's not there anymore. Not there anymore. What's there anymore is something else. Somebody from Bollywood or you know something or something or something. And that's what goes on. In today, I mean. So, and then what's the consequence? Culture 
diminishes. Here's the, I didn't read the footnote, but it starts, human life is meant for earning values. So hearing topics of transcendence is a method, the primary method of learning values. It, it's built into that sound vibration. It lifts consciousness and the, the finer sentiments of living beings flourish like a seed becoming sprouted. And when that's missing, then culture starts to degrade. That's the message. That's what, that's what the Bhagavatam is saying, and Prabhupada is, yeah, he's heavy. But why is he being heavy, I explained. He wants people to, it's like, wake up. So it's not saying you people are bad. It's, you know, wake up. Where's this train going? The train of leaving t topics of transcendence out and just refining one's skills in the world, whatever that might be. You know, technology skills or athletic skills or political skills or military skills or... And, you know, that's advancement. That's problematic. That's the message. It, 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 there's consequences for that. Yeah, but somehow I am reading it the way I got that message that what they wear, Bhagavatam is taking us. And that's what I said before. If we read it superficially, like what the, okay. just the statement is. It, it's, not, you know, it, it's not that Prabhupada was a people basher either. No, that's the superficial. Superficially, look look at this fellow. He's just bashing. How proud, how audacious, how harsh. I'm staying away from that person. That's not what he did. I mean, if you look at the if you look at it superficially, that's what he's doing. And if you look at it in, in a deeper sense, what was he doing? He was sacrificing his life to travel at his elderly age and time and writing books. And why? Because he wanted people to be happy. And what's the obstacle for being happy? Indulging the senses in a wanton way in, in materialistic life without any sense of the higher purpose of life. That covers what real happiness is. And people are chasing after that other kind of so-called happiness that leads them to a civilization that's miserable. Look around. Is misery happening? Are people being unkind to each other? Yes, there's kindness. And that's nice. And it's insufficient. It's, it, kindness is resting upon transcendence. Yeah. Remember the, the, one of the last times I was in New York, going through the Holland Tunnel, there's these big billboards just getting in, entering into the tunnel, then on the other side, just coming out of the tunnel. Huge billboard said, commit a random act of kindness. Like it's so rare. At least random, do some kindness. And that's the state of affairs. So what's kindness resting upon? It's resting upon transcendence. Supposing that the, the that which elevates consciousness is not just kindness that elevates the modes of nature, but one is still caught in the modes of nature. And without transcendence, it's, you know, the, the, the time factor results in degradation. So it's not a condemnation. It's a wishing for an individual and then in society in, in a broad sense, to find real happiness. So if you look superficially, it looks like he's bashing. And it's not nice. I don't like people that bash. There is a question online. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the earlier message. Thank you, Gurmaraj. 
This is from Arvind Devarakonda. Uh, I have a doubt about whether every human being gets an equal opportunity to know about Krishna in human life. For example, people born in extreme poverty might not even think about spiritual life. Maybe he's typing more, I don't know, but this is what the message is as of now. One is not prohibited, one is not banned from spiritual elevation due to bad karma. One is not banned from spiritual elevation due to bad karma. So Janma, Aishvarya, Shruta, Shri, these four things are symptoms of good karma. Supposing one doesn't have them, is one banned? Definitely not. And in fact, somebody that ha has some of those things may try to become the uh, material enjoyer of those things. Beauty, wealth, knowledge, high birth, and just become indulgent in the, the facilities that come from those things. That those, are, those tendencies are also there. So minus those things is not a, a ban, a prohibition, and having those things is not a qualification. There's no, there's no qualification, disqualification on the material side for spiritual elevation. Now, if somebody has some impoverished condition, they may be just struggling, struggling, struggling for survival. Just like last night, I had a discussion with Naranjana Maharaj, who is the GBC for the Ukraine. And he was sharing with me what it's like being the GBC for Ukraine, and what the devotees in Ukraine are going through. So, um, without you know, detailing, some have shrapnel wounds, some have lost their home, some don't have food, you know, they, they don't have financial resource. It's like extremely difficult. <clears throat> and it's also very satisfying to see the devotee community worldwide reaching out. So it's not like they've got a bad birth because they were born in the Ukraine. They're really wonderful devotees. And then when there's hardship, or worse, <clears throat> why? Because that question comes. Why? They're good. They're really, really amazing devotees. Really amazing devotees. Why hardship? Like this? Misfortune may have its silver lining, and that is they're taking deeper and deeper and deeper shelter of Krishna and having the devotee community reaching out from all around the world to help them as they can. So it's giving them the opportunity to be the recipients of service from other devotees who, according to their capacity and inclination, do something. So... If someone's not born in a, a wealthy family and they're struggling, that's due to their past activity. At the same time, it's not a, a ban. And that is, it requires those, that, those Vaishnavas, those devotees of the Lord, that have capacity and compassion, they reach out to those persons. It's, it's a material estimation is the, the stepping back from the question. I don't want to go into whatever he else is writing because it's the same topic. The same thing, that's what he Same topic. Yes. So, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, sometimes people criticize, why don't you feed the poor? You have some resource. Use that resource to feed the poor. Why aren't you feeding the poor? Bhakti Siddhanta, who's not poor? Spiritually poor, everyone should get prasadam, not just the people who are impoverished. Everyone should get prasadam because they're all poor. And Prabhupada said like that, you know, it, it, in, in Juhu Temple, you know, the, the prasadam distribution should be for everybody, not just the people who are going to give money or just the people who are poor. Prasadam distribution should be for everyone. So spiritual compassion isn't discriminating who's wealthy, who's poor. If somebody is struggling, then one can do something 
to for one's capacity to help somebody that's struggling. But everyone is, spiritually speaking, impoverished or moving in that direction. You know, have, there's a paucity of spiritual well-being, speaking in, in general terms. And so compassion should go to that point. And misfortune has everything to do with one's past and extend compassion to regardless of one's past. Not just give special attention to those whose karma is um, difficult. And then those that have good karma should use that resource of their good karma for the benefit of others, which can mean all kinds of things, like spreading Krishna consciousness for the benefit of others. Next. Guru Maharaj, this person has not identified themselves. Their name says A, B, C and some numbers, and the question hasn't popped up yet. Okay. He's saying he's writing it, but not has popped okay, up. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah. 